BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, and on Wednesdays this year I've been doing a regular segment about the story of Jack the Ripper which is perhaps the most famous unsolved murder mystery in the entire world. Jack the Ripper was not only a serial killer, but I believe an appropriate term should also be spree killer, because the Whitechapel murders happened, well, over a period of several years, but the prime concentration of Jack the Ripper activity that most people accept in the Ripper lore is from August 31st of 1888 to November 9th of 1888. And recently on the channel, I was talking about some Jack the Ripper suspects, such as Charles Lechmere, as well as Aaron Kosminski, and I have episodes about both of them. And I really find that the methodology that people are using to zone in on these particular suspects is very different. With Charles Lechmere, it was all about geographic profiling, with Aaron Kosminski, it was mostly about behavioral profiling, really trying to show that he had maniacal tendencies and mental instability, and he was living in the vicinity of certain crime scenes. And then there was a, an alleged, I repeat, alleged DNA breakthrough, where some people thought they actually had physical evidence that could connect him to the case. But the Jack the Ripper story remains unsolved to this day. And before I say anything about today's suspect, I would like to remind you guys that a great way to help support a channel like this is just by listening. You can also hit the like button, subscribe, share with your friends and family on social media. If you know anyone who is curious about true crime cases or unsolved mysteries, feel free to send them a link to this episode, especially if they're into something like Jack the Ripper or the Zodiac Killer. And another way to help out is to go over to buymeacoffee.com. There's a link to that in the description box. Buymeacoffee.com allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout-out on Zodiac Monday. Now, I'm very honest. I'm a newcomer to the Jack the Ripper case. I'm a newcomer to this mystery. And today's suspect is one that rather surprised me, because he's one of the first people that I learned about when reading about Jack the Ripper. It wasn't the first episode on the Ripper, but the second one that I did, which I released in 2021, was called The Murder of Long Liz Stride. And one name came up very early on in that story, and his name is Louis Deemschutz. Now, some people would pronounce this Louis, other people would pronounce his last name differently, but there are actually more than 10 variations of his last name in print, and one of them was even spelled D-I-M-S-H-I-T-S, Dimshits. I couldn't believe that, but yes. And I'm going to be referring to him as Louis, and I think that that's perfectly acceptable. So, Jack the Ripper, as I said, was a spree killer, and the first murder that took place was the murder of Polly Nichols. The second one was the murder of Annie Chapman, and the third and fourth murders happened on the same night, and they are referred to as the double event. And Louis Deemschutz is connected to the Jack the Ripper story because he participates in the inquest after the third murder, the murder of Elizabeth Stride. And 
he is perhaps what you would call a witness, or perhaps just someone who has some type of information about the case, someone who is in the vicinity, not exactly watching the murder take place, but he could have been the person that startled the killer, and the killer had to hurry away and get away from the crime scene and then look for another victim, that being Catherine Eddowes, and that's what led to the double event. And to people who endorse the single killer theory, they support that by looking at a Jack the Ripper communication called the Saucy Jackie Postcard, which states very clearly that double event tonight, the first one squealed a bit, meaning that Jack the Ripper wanted to mutilate the victims. But I said there was a particular difference in methodology among uh, Charles Lechmere, Aaron Kosminski, and Louis Diemschutz, and that is that this is not going to be one that is solely focused on geographic profiling, nor solely focused on behavioral issues. Instead, it's possible that the Ripper crimes could have been politically motivated, and that Louis Diemschutz would have been a very integral player in this political motivation. However, looking at the double event, and before we say anything about theorizing, I just began to wonder, how on earth could Louis Diemschutz be a suspect in the Ripper case? I mean, he is driving a horse and carriage or a pony and carriage, Go up, I guess you'd call it a buggy rather than a carriage, that's going by near the murder of Liz Stride. And then there's the police inquest, and as I understand, they're blowing a whistle, and then they're alerting people. And if he's there... How on earth did he meet up with Catherine Eddowes 15 minutes later and participate in that murder when people know his whereabouts at the time of the Eddowes murder? And we'll see very clearly that this was a multiple killers theory and that this is also tying into the political motivation. M multiple people are involved with the creation of the Ripper persona. And let's find out a little bit more why. Let's go to casebook.org, the way I've done, with several of these other Jack the Ripper suspects. Louis Deemschutz, witness at Elizabeth Stride's inquest, also referred to as Deemschitz or Deemschitz, born on, born in 1862, a street salesman of cheap jewelry, living at 40 Burner Street, where he was also the steward of the International Working Men's Educational Club. He lived with his wife, who assisted him with the management of the club. Deemschutz left the club at 11.30 a.m. on September 29th of 1888 to go to the market at West O'Hill, Crystal Palace. He returned at 1 a.m. the following morning to deposit his unsold goods at the club before stabling his pony at George Yard, Cable Street. He drove his pony and cart to Dutfield's Yard, noticing that both gates were wide open and that the yard was very dark. On entering, his pony shied and to the left and would go no further. And as he looked down, he noticed that there was something lying on the ground, but was not able to distinguish what it was. He prodded the object with a whip before getting off the cart and striking a match and blew it in the wind. And he was able to get sufficient light to see that it was a woman lying there. He went straight into the club to see if his wife was there, and seeing that she was, told her and several others who were in the room of his find. But he said that he could not tell if the woman was drunk or dead. Getting a candle, he went back into the yard with Isaac Kozabrowski and Morris Eagle, and was able to see that there was blood on the ground. The three men did not touch the body, but immediately set out to find the police. Diemschutz and Kozabrowski, running south toward Faircloth Street and then in the direction of Grove Street, shouted for help. Eagle ran north to Commercial Street, and they did not find an officer, so they turned back to Edward Spooner, who joined them and on their return to Dutfield's yard. In his witness testimony, Deemschutz claimed to have not noticed the position of her hands, and yet in subsequent press interviews, he stated her hands were clenched, and when the doctor opened them, I saw that she had been holding grapes in one hand and sweet meats in the other. Louis Deemschutz, along with Isaac Kozabrowski, were arrested in March of 1889 during a disturbance at the International Working Men's Club and charged with assaulting police. Deemschutz was sentenced to three months imprisonment and hard labor, as well as paying a 40-pound fine and producing two surties of 20 pounds each to be forfeited if he failed to be of good behavior for 12 months. Deemschutz was obviously a committed socialist and was listed 
as speaking at a club in Manchester in 1891 on the theme of the Paris Commune. And you see um, already some of his political motivations. But I, wanted, I don't want to get too caught up in that because I told you I just read something from casebook.org. And those are very basic introductions. But if anyone would like to hear a larger presentation on Louis Diemschutz as a Jack the Ripper suspect, I would invite them to go over to the Jack the Ripper Tour YouTube channel, which has a one-hour presentation on Louis Diemschutz as a Jack the Ripper suspect, and he is, well, I shouldn't say he, the case for him as a suspect is presented by an, an author named Randy Williams, who wrote the book Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror, and in addition to accusing Diemschutz of being an active participant in the Ripper murders, he also talks about some of the inspirations for Jack the Ripper, and one of them is actually Sherlock Holmes, since the title of his book, saying that Sherlock Holmes was published in 1887, and we're talking about the writings of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and that there were certain clues and motivations and influences from Sherlock Holmes that could be found in the Ripper case. Now, there appears to be a post that is written as a follow-up to that interview, or a follow-up to the book, and it's called My Number One Suspect, Louis Diemschutz, by Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror. And so, the, I'm just going to read this. It's actually, as I said, posted on Facebook. The following is a compilation that led me to believe that Louis Diemschutz is the real Jack the Ripper, one of three and possibly four Jacks. As I said, multiple killers. Theory already. One of the first pieces of evidence in favor of Louis Diemschutz being Jack the Ripper, just from this post, as well as from the interview I was watching, state that at the inquest after the murder of Liz Stride, he had a full beard, but three days later, when he talked to the police again, he had shaved his beard, and this could have been done to either confuse witnesses or just so a completely different looking person showed up than what anybody had seen before, altering his appearance. I put together an algorithm of characteristics and facts that are most commonly true of all serial murderers, and then applied that template to all of the men that even remotely were involved in the case. As each name is dropped through each of the 27 filters, their names are weighted by the outcome of each. I then attempt to exonerate those names, which are the heaviest at the end. I continue to follow the process. As I understand the first method that is used in this algorithm is finding someone who lived relatively close by to the crime scenes because serial killers will often operate near their home. And, I mean, I think that that is somewhat true, but after talking about hundreds of serial killer cases here on Black Box Online Radio, we'll definitely see that that isn't always the case. I mean, sometimes you will find that there are serial killers who are going to break the pattern, or they aren't going to fit any particular mold, or they're just operating in a way that is inconsistent with conventional thought. But the second connection and reason why people think that Louis Diemschutz could be a Jack the Ripper suspect is that he had this connection to the International Working Men's Educational Club, which was not only described as some type of socialist organization, but also an anarchist organization. And while I was listening to that interview done by Williams, it was stated that that group was actually founded by Peter Kropotkin, and that's a name that I don't hear too frequently. I first learned his name because of a novel called The Watch that was written by Dennis Danvers, and it's a rather fascinating story. I mean, it's fictional. It deals with some things like time travel, but it talks about this guy named Peter Kropotkin, a prince who gave up his title to become an anarchist. And to this whole type of anarcho-socialist movement, one of the greatest threats they thought would have been prostitution, or it's just denigrating to the human essence, so to speak. And the Ripper victims were prostitutes. I mean, yes, I mean, I can even say that, sex workers. And that these crimes were done to influence modern culture, to alter the way that people were thinking, to shine a light on how prostitution was bad in their minds. 
and there were some differences among the Ripper crimes, and particularly the murder of Mary Kelly, which was perhaps Jack the Ripper's most horrific crime, and her body was not only mutilated, perhaps you could say eviscerated, and that the first four victims, Polly Nichols, Annie Chapman, Liz Stride, and Catherine Nettos, were murdered outside, and Mary Kelly was murdered inside, and the reason put forward is that the Ripper wanted to commit a crime in which he could not be interrupted. Whereas, I mean, said very clearly, I mean, either it's Louis Deemstoots driving his horse and cart, and he interrupts the Ripper, so the Ripper has to run away, or Louis Deemstoots is an active participant, and it's very difficult to commit these crimes outside, because they could be interrupted so easily. These aren't like the Zodiac Killer crimes, which are in secluded areas, like a car that's parked 500 yards from any other person. I mean, this is in the city, and people can interrupt the killer's activities very quickly. So by committing the murder of Mary Kelly indoors, then her body could be severely mutilated or eviscerated, and it just, it's making people think in a certain way. The, and yes, this does turn into somewhat of a conspiracy theory that certain people are committing crimes because they want to control how other people think. And it's just there are people in the shadows that are manipulating human thought. But if I understand what Randy Williams said in his interview is that the title Jack the Ripper would not necessarily have come from Louis Deemschutz. It would have come from Peter Kropotkin himself, and that, you know, again, this is a political movement, that there this was a multi-part organization and operation to have these murders committed. They were calculated, and they were not done arbitrarily. And there actually are some very technical reasons what he talks about in terms of how it's almost making a mockery of certain Catholic holidays or nights of importance and very technical stuff that I'll have to read up more on in the future. I'm sure some of you are waiting to hear a particular type of skeptical response. So here's one coming from Dr. Anthony LaPala, who was not around at the time of the Ripper crimes, but I talked about his observations of the Phantom Killer mystery from 1946, another unidentified serial killer. And as a forensic psychologist, he stated very clearly that Deviation from the pattern on the fifth victim is completely normal for a spree killer because it's confusing the authorities. Everybody would expect Jack the Ripper to attack outside, so he attacks inside. And with the Phantom Killer, everybody expected him to attack outside, so he attacked inside, deviating th from the pattern to avoid getting caught. But that would suggest a single perpetrator. Another skeptical response is one that I talk about all the time, because I think there's a chance that it could be true, and that is the Frederick Best Confession of 1931, where a journalist admitted that he fabricated two of the Jack the Ripper letters, the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard, and there is a certain amount of consideration that should be placed on that, but no matter what, if that is indeed true or false, I mean... The connection that Liz Stride has to the Jack the Ripper case is the Saucy Jackie postcard. Her murder is committed in a completely different way, and it's just her crime took place 15 minutes before Jack the Ripper met up with Catherine Eddowes, who was then murdered shortly after. But it's that piece of writing that unites the crimes. Double event this time, the first one squealed a bit. If that weren't there, there would be a much larger debate about whether or not Liz Stride was actually murdered by the Ripper. Even though I don't know this 100%, I do lean toward that being a fictitious connection. And I said very clearly in some of the earliest Jack the Ripper episodes that I did that I thought there was about a 10% chance that Liz Stride was actually murdered by the Ripper. But let's go back to some of the reasons why Louis Deemschutz could be a Jack the Ripper suspect. Physical description. Eyewitness descriptions are always very close to the same except to, to the same, with the exception of ages ranging from 19 to 25 to 30 to 45, which almost always closely match uh, one of the three. Well, I mean, eyewitness descriptions 
I mean, some people can see a 20-year-old, some see a 30-year-old, some see a 40-year-old. I don't know if they're all close in range. Evidence shows that victims Smith and Tabram were killed by multiple offenders. These are not confirmed Jack the Ripper victims, mind you. Smith lived to tell the story of her attacker, and Tabram was killed with two knives, a six-inch and a nine-inch. It is extremely rare for one killer to use more than one knife in a single murder. Mostly, I think that that's somewhat true. However, with Martha Tabram, as I understand, she was stabbed several times, numerous times, as opposed to being mutilated the way that the Ripper victims were. All three descriptions given by Smith of her attackers match Louis Deemschutz. If he is the person that was listed in the 1891 census I located, he would have been 41 to 42 years old in 1888, accounting for those witness descriptions of an older third man. Well, that means that he wouldn't have been born in 1862, and I guess there's some type of discrepancy in the records. He is a perfect fit for the sighting reported and described by Matthew Packer of 25 to 30 years old, as Deemschutz was 26 in 1888. Well, that makes no sense at all. Okay, so, Louis Deemschutz fits the descriptions given by the eyewitness Israel Schwartz during the double event of the attacker and the man seen standing in the street as the assault took place. Louis Deemschutz also fits the description of the man seen by P.C. William Smith speaking to, speaking in the street to V. Stride just prior to her murder perfectly. So that one read in itself in the newspaper the day after the double event, he panicked and shaved off a portion of his beard, which was forbidden by the Torah. Deemschutz was Jewish, with the knowledge that he had been seen in the inquest and recognized by Smith. In one very good and generally accepted description, Jack is seen to be wearing a horseshoe tie pin and a massive gold chain and a large seal with red stone hanging from it. This could not have been real if it had been worn in the poorest, most crime-ridden area of London. Thus, it was very likely to have been costume jewelry, which Louis Deemschutz was a dealer in by his own testimony, as well as a horseshoe in a subsequent arrest. The rest of Jack's description at the Murray Kelly scene also fits perfectly with the artist's rendering taken at the Stride Inquest, seen above, in which the suspect was clean-shaven other than the mustache. All crimes took place within a ten-minute walking distance from the club. The Lusk parcel, containing a victim's kidney portion with the enclosed From Hell letter, as well as the saucy Jackie postcard, the only two communications I believe to be authentic, both originated from the EC postmark. So, I'm not sure if the um, author of this text, Randy Williams, has had some type of reversal, because in the interview that he did on the Jack the Ripper tour channel, he also stated that the Dear Boss letter was authentic. And if this is true here, the From Hell letter as well as the Saucy Jackie postcard, the only two communications I believe to be authentic, I would have to disagree sharply with that because i mean the dear boss letter is the first jack the ripper communication that's accepted announces jack the ripper to the world let's look at the reasons why the saucy jackie postcard should also be written by the same person handwriting similarities in handwriting both have the similar writing style and also forensic linguistics there was some Linguistic analysis that was done by Dr. Andrea Nini, which identified eight particular linguistic combinations and clusters of language that are found in both the Saucy Jackie postcard and the Dear Boss letter. And I think for all intents and purposes, it seems very, very obvious to me that the Dear Boss letter and the Saucy Jackie postcard were written by the same person. The From Hell letter, different handwriting, different tone, different language kidney portion mailed in, half a kidney actually, but at the same time, I mean, it could be different, I mean, people are allowed to alter their writing style, those three could have been written by the same person, and um, to the credit of Randy Williams, it does seem that he um, has stated here that in the uh, Jack the Ripper tour interview, that he did indeed think the Dear Boss letter was also authentic, I'm not sure about this comment here in the post, but the exact East End area where Deemschutz Club was located was only a place a local would have known, and only a local would have even known who George Lusk was, let alone how to get a package to him, as he was not widely known outside of Whitechapel. 
and George um, Lusk received the kidney, and he was the chair of the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee. Until after receiving the postcard, George Lusk became famous, not before. He lived on the perimeter of roughly a D-shaped pattern that forms the five canonical murder sites, as well as in the center of a group of nine other contemporary attacks. Well, this is some ridiculous stuff about how, oh, there are five canonical attacks, and they form into a letter D, and Deemschutz's last name begins with D. I've also heard the theory that the five Jack the Ripper victims can be drawn into a pentagram, but um, not Randy Williams, but Rand Gautier on the show Pam and Tommy informs us that a pentagram is just any five-pointed star, and if you draw a circle around it, then it forms into the pentacle, but anybody can take five points and draw them into a five-pointed star. It just depends on how sloppy it is. And I'm you're going to have to do a lot more than just say, well, five different crimes roughly resemble the shape of a D. You can fudge a lot of different shapes into those maps, and people do. A check on the map reveals that Burner Street, where Dean Schutz lives, his clubhouse and home, is to be one of the actual crimes, and in the middle of the group of 13 murders and one attack, my team attributes to the group. Criminologists have referred to the serial killer's comfort zone as how serial killers will commit their crimes relatively close to their home as they prefer to hunt their victims at places they are familiar with, an area where they feel confident and in control. I mean, I think that that's mostly true, just not always true. All these conditions will generally link a killer close to home, and were a familiar area, they will know. Emma Smith, a non-canonical victim, lived and was murdered at St. George Street, excuse me, at George Street, where Tabram also lived and was murdered. According to his testimony, Louis Deemschutz's cart was kept in George Yard, Cable Street. And Louis Deemschutz was a costume seller, a seller of costume jewelry, and that's already been stated before the reason as to why. Louis Deemschutz was highly educated, as stated above, Louis Deemschutz was the steward of the men's educational club, although it was in fact an anarchist club with an anti-England agenda and a strong desire at all costs to end something that was called the sweatage system, which oppressed workers. Louis Deemschutz spoke Russian and English, and um, as again, this ties into his connections to Jack, to um, Peter Kropotkin, and interestingly, the Louis Deemschutz interview that I've been referencing only came out about a month ago, so it keeps up with some of the contemporary events. And there was the cane that was revealed recently that has not exactly a composite sketch, but there's a carving of a Russian Jack the Ripper suspect. And Randy Williams stated that he believed that the cane belong the cane depicts the face of Louis Deemschutz, not um anybody else. The next point is escalation of criminal behavior. Like of many other serial murders throughout history, the Ripper murders were an attack that was an escalation from non-fatal knife attacks. Millwood, Wilson, and Smith, the two of the last who died subsequently to their attacks, to much more gruesome killings. We now know that the killers often change their modus operandi. Nearly all of them have less serious previous offenses on their record. Well, I'm not sure. Nearly all serial killers have less serious pre offenses on their record. It depends on how broad you want to get. I mean, some serial killers do not have any offenses on their record other than maybe something like getting detention in the first grade. I, I don't think that that's a fair statement. There's a strong possibility that Zeph was the man connected to an indecent assault in 1886. History of Violent Crime. As stated above, Louis Deemschutz was arrested for an assault on a boy and a number of adults and a police constable in a riot on March 16th of 1889. Well, I mean, history of violent crime, and you're talking about something in 1889 after the murder of Jack the Ripper? I don't think that that's quite true, or that's not a fair point. But here's that stuff um, about victimology and altering the way that humans think, altering the modern culture. Why prostitutes? Besides their relative accessibility, they were chosen for a reason. The salacious nature of prostitution murders to gain the most attention possible. I believe they were chosen to act as murders to the Ripper's cause. As stated before, communist, anarchist, socialist beliefs at the time were extremely anti-prostitution. 
and the subject of their victimization in society was often brought up in anarchist literature. I believe their Christianity played a part as well. I would have been able to confirm 13 or 14 victims as Christian. An early victim, Emma Smith, followed, was followed and attacked and killed by walking past a Christian church. After walking past a Christian church, I think it means. So as you see, though, these crimes were all orchestrated as part of a fictitious plot to to alter human culture, to alter modern thought. And by fictitious, I mean there are multiple killers, but they're trying to make people think that it's one killer to get everyone to think in a certain way. And another piece of evidence that was shared in the interview was that Catherine Eddowes was found in Mitre Square. And Mitre is the name of the hat that is worn by the Pope. And the Pope at the time was Leo the Thirteenth. And just a quick side note, I said if I ever became the Pope, I would also use the name Leo. And uh, there's some very complicated reasons for that. However, I'm not Catholic, and I will never be the Pope. I just, that's just some coincidence. But anyway, the mitre is the hat that is worn by the Pope. And that was definite, blatant Catholic mockery. So has been theorized. Now... A lot of this stuff is just interpretation, and I mean speculation, guesswork, educated guesswork, but guesswork all the same, educated all the same. And when I was listening to Randy Williams do the presentation on Louis Deemschutz as a Jack the Ripper suspect, number one, I talk about multiple killers all the time in these true crime cases, but this is an organized group of multiple killers, and I often find that the evidence tends to veer away from that because a simpler explanation can simply be provided that if there are multiple killers, perhaps you would have something like one person committing the mutilations and another unidentified person murdered Liz Stride. And then you have the journalist Frederick Best writing letters pretending to be Jack the Ripper. And then he says that Jack the Ripper murdered both. Uh, Catherine Eddowes and Liz Stride on the same night, so then the real killer decided to write the From Hell letter and include a portion of the victim's kidney to show that he was the real killer. I mean, something like that I think is so much more plausible than murdering prostitutes to draw attention to a communist, anarcho-socialist political agenda. And again, like when I'm listening to this stuff, I'm like, all right, I know that the presenter doesn't know everything that he's stating to be fact, but it's like, how on earth are you drawing these conclusions and generating these specific details and putting these specific pieces of information into play? Well, I think Louis Deemschutz murdered Liz Stride and he wanted the police constable to blow the whistle to create a diversion so that Catherine Eddowes could be murdered in Mitre Square. I mean... That's borderline mind-reading over an entire group of people, and I think that's rather far out. And here is the ultimate conclusion, the elephant in the room. Just because somebody is a witness to a case doesn't mean they were an active participant. This guy could have just been someone who was riding his horse and cart down the street. And, um, end of story. Wrong place, wrong time. But, at the same time, as we talked about in the Charles Lechmere episode, he has a definite connection to one of the crime scenes, a definitive connection to one of the crime scenes, and he can be placed in the area, and his suspicious behavior. I mean, I even think the thing about shaving his beard is somewhat reasonable to discuss. I mean, altering someone's appearance so they wouldn't match descriptions. Yes, I mean, I get curious about that. It doesn't mean he was the killer, though. However, what do you think about Louis Deemschutz as a Jack the Ripper suspect? And what do you think about this political conspiracy theory behind the Ripper crimes? Please put your ideas in the comment section down below. And always like, subscribe, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnet88. And that will be all for me now. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnet88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.